Go. Okay. Okay. So welcome everybody today to today's meeting of the online CUNY Set Theory Seminar. And we're very privileged today to have New speaking to us. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name. You can see it on his slide. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Nu is a uh, recent uh, PhD. He received his doctorate last uh, year working with James Cummings. He now has a postdoc in Tel Aviv working with Moti Gittik. And he's going to speak to us about forcing with overlapping supercompact extenders, first part of his talk, which will conclude next week. Okay, Nu, take it away. All right, thank you, Adapter, and thanks for um, inviting me. Uh, sorry, my computer is old and then my camera does not work, so you're not gonna see my face. Uh, okay, so for the first part, okay, so for the both parts, actually, um, the main theme of, of this, um, this kind of project is to build up some forcing and then investigate some properties. So it's probably, well, if I don't say anything about the characterization of the forcing, then I, I will not have anything to talk. So I have to dig down into like a structure of the forcing. And of course it's not a lot in every single detail. Um, yeah, okay. But first of all, let me give some background. So if you're familiar with the pricky type forcings, um, it has to do oftentimes with the singular, like singular finals or combinatorics at the, um, Single high nodes and probably some successor of them or double successors. Um, in this case, we are going to consider like um, SCH. So, what is uh, the singular final hypothesis? It just means that if kappa is singular, then the value of two to the kappa is at least as possible. So, roughly speaking, uh, you should like uh, you can think of SCH as TCH on um, singular high nodes. And in, in a lot of cases in, in the forcing extension, um, when we try to do something with singular kappa, then kappa is gonna be like strong limit, singular high node. And we need it to be two to kappa, it's kappa plus. And in terms of ZFC constraints, so unlike the GCH on regular high nodes, you know, like by Eastern theorem, right? That if kappa is regular, then to the kappa can be as big as we want, as long as it follows Koenig's um, behavior. For singular kino, um, it's different. Um, if kappa is singular and has uncountable cofinality, and if GCH holds stationarily many lambda less than kappa, then necessarily to the kappa has to be kappa plus two. And as a consequence, if you want to fit, like um, break the SCH at singular kino, then the least one that you should expect is of countable cofinality. And there's also a theorem from Galvin and Hoyna um, generalizing Stewart theorem. And there's uh, some excellent theorem from Schiller from um, PCF theory that if Aleph omega is strong limit, then to the Aleph omega is less than Aleph omega four. So it's very surprising that, well, some people, like the work in the past, you can blow up the value up to the Aleph um, omega to be some Aleph omega plus one, or even further than that, but not more than Aleph omega one. And Shilalu Shaw is very impressive that, okay, you cannot just blow up to any value. There's some explicit, like there's some bound that you have to be aware of. And in terms of the upper bound of, of trying to violate the SCH, there, there, there are a few, I, I think there are a lot right now, but in the past, um, there, there are a few forcings that attempt to violate the SCH at um, some, some kind, uh, singular kind of uncountable profanity. So for example, if you, start with the super compact kino. Uh, I think then zero has a way to force so that the kappa will become measurable and two to the kappa is kappa double plus. And then if you force with um, pricky, for, like pre basic pricky forcing, then you're gonna sing singularize um, kappa and save the failure of 
um, GCH, and which is now is failure of SEH at Kappa. And yeah, later on, there are also works from, I think, Makido and Sheila um, use some, I think Makido used a huge kino, and then Sheila later on used the super compact to try to violate the SEH. Um, and then they can also bring down to Aleph Omega. And they can blow up the value of two to the Aleph Omega to Aleph Alpha plus one for any fixed uh, countable alpha. Just as a historical remark, uh, Magidor's original paper, uh, uh, Super Compact 2 or whatever it is, uh, I think it's in 1977, 1978, Annals of Mathematics. It used a Super Compact with a huge above it. Ah, I see. All right. That was, that was the exact hypothesis. I see. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. Um, I think later on, um, I think from the ground, ground working from Mitchell and Woodin about some inner model, I guess. Um, Gitik and I think also Makido, I think they were together to, to get the, the failure of SEH, um, let's say at countable cofinality, assume, assuming the Mitchell order of kappa is kappa double plus. So it's just something um, stronger than measurable kino and weaker than something like kappa plus two strong. And not only that, um, I think Gitik also proved that they are actually equally consistent. So if you have failure, the failure of SEH, then necessarily the O of kappa has to be kappa double plus is like a lower bound. So it concludes that um, in order to make a failure of SEH, then large kino is necessary. Okay. And Essentially, I think there are a few ways to try to validate the SCH. So you assume some large kinos and try to build up, build up some parsing. Um, so in the first case, you probably try to start with some large kino and then try to validate GCH at kappa and then singularize kappa. Uh, sometimes you violate GCH first and then singularize it. Sometimes you do both at the same time, and it's possible sometimes. And the second, second situation, which is the main theme of this talk and the next talk is um, you have the limit of large kinos where the supremum is um, singular. So you have a sequence of large kinos, kappa alpha for alpha less than eta, where eta is limit. Then you try to violate the SCH at the soup of it. Okay, and that's gonna be the situation that we are considering. And okay, so today I'm not going to go into detail about you know, the, the the overlapping super compact extenders. Um, instead, I would like to warm up with the GitX original work in um, the paper. Um, I think it's called blowing up the power of a singular kind of uncountable conformity, something like that. Um, so let's assume that in the ground model, there's a GCH, you have a sequence of large kinos. So the sequence of kappa alpha of alpha less than eta. Um, you have some lambda, which is something that um, in the final model is going to be a value of two to the soup of kappa alpha. So assume kappa alpha is strong, um, eta is a limit orinal, is below the, the first large kinal. Lambda is above all of them, lambda is regular. Then there's a forcing that preserves uh, kinos and cofinities such that two to the soup is lambda. And I think it conjectures that with this kind of assumption, it should be optimal. I mean. Um, is something slightly weaker than strong, maybe some strong with some parameters, maybe like um, lambda strong. Uh, I think probably lambda strong or something. Yeah, and that should be optimal. Okay, and now I'm going to jump into the detail about the construction right now. So 
I will try to slow down a, bit, uh, a little bit later on. If you have any question, then feel free to ask. So do you have GCH below the soup of the kappa alphas or is it's just a strong limit? Um, well, I think, uh, first of all, due to the soup of kappa alpha, alpha less than beta for beta limit, it's gonna be like that SEH is gonna fail on, on that kernel. Um, but more than that, I think GCH will fail and hold in the uniform way based on the forcing. So, okay, but in particular, uh, you, this supremum is going to be a strong limit cardinal still. Yes, yes, the two, yeah, true. So the sup, supremum is going to be strong limit. Okay, thank you. And, yeah, and it, it's going to reflect down to any limit of large kernels. So not only true to the sup of kappa alpha alpha less than eta is lambda. Um, for example, to, to the soup of kappa alpha, where alpha less than omega is going to be large in some sense as well, not only just the soup and then take a plus is something more than that. So, I mean, you should expect that because, because of the zero theorem. Okay. So, in order to understand the forcing, let me give you a brief uh, story about the F senders. Um, so let J be a map from elementary embedding from V to M, critical point is kappa, J of kappa is greater than lambda. Uh, let's assume that is strong in some sense. So v, v lambda is a subset of M and M is close under kappa sequences. Sorry. Then, uh, let E be the kappa lambda extender derived from J. Um, I will not go into detail about the classical construction. I'll explain it later in terms of the Marimovich and Dittig style. But basically it's gonna be like a direct system, direct system of ultra filters. So for each ultra filter, you have a map and then the, the maps together will form a direct system then you can form a direct limit model. And the direct limit model is going to be well, well founded. And what's going to get from this is the derived map from the extender is going to approximate the large kind of property from J. So if I take JE from V to the direct limit model out VE, then you're gonna recover most of your properties. So critical point of JE is kappa, J of kappa is greater than equal to lambda, and ME is close under kappa sequences. And to avoid this annoying thing that, well, maybe JE of kappa is lambda in, in some cases. So I'm, I'm gonna assume that that is a function as from kappa to kappa such that uh, it's a type of, sorry, such that JE of S of kappa is lambda. So you can think of it as some um, um, lever diamond function in some super compact um, context. But I mean, it works on some strong, like strong kind as well. Okay. So now I'm going to describe um, the E in Gitix and Marivo style. Um, first of all, I define D as a domain, if D is a subset of lambda, D has size kappa, and kappa plus one is a subset of D. And I define MC of D as the JE restricted to D inverse. So let, if you take a look a bit, um, MC of D, what is MC of D? It's gonna be some order preserving function. And it's going to do something which I will tell you in the next slide, I guess. Um, you can define A, you define A to be in E of D, even only if MC of D is in J of A. So it looks like uh, some theory of large kernels when, for example, if you have a measurable kernel, you have a J mapping, then you define something like A is large if you're not if kappa is in J of A. So is similar in this situation. So basically it says that A is large if J of A contains the nice candidate. 
And it's important to note that MCFD is in the out VE because um, D is a subset of lambda, but um, D has size kappa and ME is closed under kappa sequences. So in general, uh, oh, oh, sorry, uh, try to write on something. to be in out V of A. And that's why you can say that A is large if on the, um, the ultra power side, um, you can say this thing. Oh. Okay. Now, um, if you talk about the MC, so it okay, um, it looks peculiar on what A actually concentrates on, right? Um, in in the context of measurable Hino, you can say that A is large if kappa is in J of A, and then A will concentrate on, for example, inaccessible kinos. So in this case, what does A concentrate on? So let me recall that MC of D is just a function. I abbreviate it as MC to make it look like a function sometimes. Um, and MC will map JE of alpha to alpha for every alpha in D. And I will consider a few properties regarding MC. So first of all, the domain of MC is gonna be the pointwise image of D, which is a subset of uh, well, I think I intend to say that it's a subset of J E of D, so it's stronger than what I wrote down. Um, so I need it to be a, a subset of J E of D, and the range is just D, right? Because M C maps um, J alpha to alpha for alpha in D. So clearly, the range is D, which is a subset of lambda, and lambda is less than J of kappa. And the size of domain of MC is just the size of D, right? Because it maps J of alpha to alpha for alpha in D. So the size is just kappa, which is less than J of kappa. And MC is auto-preserving. So from these properties, you can conclude that at least what a, uh, what a concentrates on. So the, the last set, uh, let's say ED will concentrate on something called the OD, uh, OB of D, which is like a collection of D objects. That's how I think Gideon Marovich called them. So it's going to be just the function. Uh, they, are, they are just functions mu, such that domain of mu um, is a subset of D. Sorry, um, I, I should say it's a subset of D. The range is a subset of kappa. Kappa is in D because I need kappa plus one to be a subset of D. So in particular, kappa will be in D. Um, and then you can con concentrate the collection of functions where kappa is in D, and it's very important. Um, the second one is the, the size of domain is less than kappa, and mu is auto-preserving. And from this, um, you can, also project down from E of D to E of kappa by saying A is in E kappa if, not, if kappa is in J A. And since kappa is just MC of J E of kappa, so you can have some projections around them and, and you can say that A is in E of K if only if the collection of mu such that if you compute the value of mu of kappa um, and it need um, I need it to be in A, then that collection has to be large in E of D. Um, any questions so far? All right, good. Um, I'll, I'll remind a few more times when I dig deep down to for the forcing construction. Okay. And if I define the measure one in the sense of E of D, then you're gonna re recover the property of extender. So in this case, 
you can take JD as a map of V to MD, which is the out of V ED. ED is just the, you can check that ED is a kappa complete um, ultra filter on concentrating on the functions new. And the elements of in MD is just, are just going to be the equivalent class F sub D for F, which is a function from the objects to V. And as usual, the story of extenders, you have the notion of projection. Um, in this way, uh, it's slightly simple, simpler than um, what you have seen um, in the classical version of extender, if, if you know what it is. So if D is a subset of D prime, they are domain, then you have the map um, OB of D prime to OB of D. Remember that OB of D prime is just a collection of function whose domain is a subset of D prime and similar to OB of D. So if you define a map pi D prime D of mu to mu restricted to D, then this is going to lift the embedding from M sub D to M sub D prime. So the, 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 the map is going to be just I D D prime of F D is just F composite with pi D prime D with respect to D prime. So each E D you get the map, um, you have the directed um, system going around them. So you can form the direct limit model. And you can check that M E is going to be the same as the out of VE if E is defined in the classical way. And furthermore, um, in the story of the direct limit, um, you can also, uh, with some analysis, you can kind of simplify by saying that um, the map, you can define the map MD to ME by saying JDE of class of F with respect to D is just JE of F of ME of MC of D. So it's something like um, when you have the factor map of large kinos and then the factor map has to define a nice way. Okay. So now I'm going to start with the, what the assumptions are. So let's consider the case where the singular final has length. So is the like a, is a soup of large cardinals of length omega one. So let's say kappa alpha is for alpha less than omega one is an increasing sequence of lambda strong cardinals. Lambda is large, uh, larger than um, all of them. E alpha is going to be the kappa alpha lambda extender. So recall that you can write E alpha as the collection of E alpha of D where D is a domain. I have some definability of lambda. So I say that there's a function S alpha from kappa alpha to kappa alpha such that J E alpha of S alpha computed at kappa alpha is lambda. And I add some extra um, assumption here. Uh, for every beta less than alpha, I need some function to define E beta inside, uh, inside the out V E alpha. So what do you mean? I mean that there is a function at su um, superscript beta subscript alpha, such that J alpha of H beta alpha kappa alpha is E beta. So one thing that um, you can conclude is that E beta is going to be inside the out of V E, e, alpha, uh, e alpha. So um, you can, oh, sorry. Uh, so if you're familiar with the notion of Mitchell increasing, you can say something like this. But it is slightly stronger than that in the sense that E beta can be defined in a nice way inside um, the out of the um, E alpha.
Okay, this one is a little bit technical. So <coughs> recall that. Uh, so you can see that e e beta is the kappa beta lambda extender, and e beta can be represented as the h beta alpha, and also lambda can be represented as represented as t e alpha s alpha kappa alpha. So if you reflect on what is going on about e alpha e beta inside e alpha, you can say something like that is a measure one set of gamma inside e alpha kappa alpha, such that if you compute h beta alpha at gamma, it's going to be kappa beta comma s alpha gamma extender, just because because of how lambda is defined inside out of V E alpha. Okay. That's going to be a lot of um, stories about this, this kind of reflection going on and on. Okay. So I will, I'll keep telling you that what's going to reflect down. Okay. And yeah, we often sometimes, uh, we often abbreviate X alpha of gamma as lambda alpha, just because um, J E of alpha is alpha, kappa alpha is lambda. So it's like a reflected of lambda. And keep in mind that lambda alpha is less than kappa alpha, just because how S alpha, is, the range of S alpha is. I am going to assume that lambda alpha is greater than kappa beta for every beta less than alpha. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, cool. Um, okay, to define the forcing, let me define some version of um, Cohen concept. So let A kappa lambda be the collection of partial functions F from lambda to kappa, such that domain of F forms a domain. So recall that it's just the subset of lambda has size kappa. Kappa plus one is a subset of domain of F. And if you consider what uh, the poset A kappa lambda looks like, it's just going to be equivalent to adding lambda new many kappa plus sets. And okay, so in the story of this housing, of course, it's gonna have some um, pricky type property. Um, and oftentimes um, you're gonna have, uh, not oftentimes, um, I think always, you're gonna have the uh, extension relation and some direct extension relation. And um, oftentimes you can consider any, any condition to be something, some sort of like end step extension of, um, of a pure condition. So if you um, know about it, just the basic value, like pretty forcing, uh, pretty, pretty forcing, the pure condition is going to have no stem at all. It's just going to be, it's just going to have only a measure one set. And a condition in the, the basic pre-key forcing is just going to be the extension of a PL condition um, by adding n ordinals for some n. Uh, looking at this way, we will make things slightly simpler in the sense that, okay, you can consider what the PL condition is first instead of defining directly what the general condition is, which is, which is much more complicated. So instead of defining the condition in general, let me start with a pure condition, okay? So a pure condition is just going to be a sequence of length omega one. Each coordinate will be a, 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 an order pair F alpha, A alpha, where F alpha is just a Cohen function described uh, as before with domain D alpha. 
So it's actually the domain. And A alpha is going to be large in E alpha of the alpha. So A alpha is going to contain functions mu with um, whose domain, uh, domain has small size, has size less than, less than kappa alpha. I should have the alpha here. And one more condition is that the sequence of domain is subset increasing. Okay. And now I can, I'm going to define the direct extension relation. So P is stronger than P is stronger than Q, like in a direct extension, even only if the first one is just FP of alpha contains F. Q, um, FQ of alpha. So FP of alpha is just the alpha coordinate, the, the cohen part of the alpha coordinate of P. So it's just going to be uh, so this thing will match with oh, is this. And then the second one is um, you should allow to, um, you have fewer choices in AP alpha to, to perform something into P. So what do I mean? I mean that the collection of mu restricted down to DQ of alpha, where mu is in AP of alpha, has to be the subset of AQ alpha. So as you can see, you basically kind of have fewer choices of mu that can be added into P somehow, comparing to what you have in AQ of alpha. And I usually call them, uh, call this property that AP alpha projects down, projects down to a subset of AQ alpha. So I think good so far about a pure condition. Okay. So now here's um, some fun story. Now I would like to start with a pure condition. So in the story of Greggy property, um, this is something that is similar to adding one ordinal into the stem. So, in this case, I'm going to add some object, an object into P and form a condition Q. And Q is going to be no, uh, no longer be pure. So the definition of Q will not fit into the definition in the last slide. But this is going to be very important in the sense that it will, at the end, will give you some desired um, uh, kind of arithmetic at the end, okay? So I draw the line to like represent, representing coordinates. I have the first line representing a um, condition P. The second line is the condition Q. I have the object inside A2, which I labeled in brown. And then I'm going to perform a one-step extension from P to Q. So, what is going on is mu will not change anything um, about P3, P4, and so on. So Q alpha is going to be the same as P alpha, but alpha greater than two. So nothing changes. At the second coordinate, P2 will change into Q2 um, as follows. I change F2 to be F2 O plus mu, which is some overwrite of F2 by mu. And remember that the, 
the size of mu is less than kappa two because of the property of the object. And F2 is a partial function from lambda to kappa two, where the domain of F2 is S size kappa two. So when you overwrite um, F2 by, by mu, you basically overwrite it partially. You, from F2, you change it to mu as much as you can. If the part is not in domain of mu, then I'll still save the information about F2. Okay. <laughs> lambda two is going to be some reflected lambda um, using S2. So lambda two is going to be S2 mu of kappa two and it's less than kappa two, okay? And so what's going on about the blue part? So the very first few coordinates, I will composite them with mu inverse. Uh, I will explain much more, uh, more later on what um, they now look like, but basically, below the second coordinate, you have to compose them with mu inverse, okay? Okay, let's look at the some easy part first. So the second coordinate, F2 O plus mu is just the overwriting. Lambda two is um, some reflection of lambda. So you can say something more about what um, A2 concentrates, and those will be the objects you, know, you are allowed to perform a one step extension. <laughs> so note that the domain of mu is a subset of B2, it's just a domain of F2. Range of mu is a subset of kappa 2. So if you override F2 plus mu, it is going to still be a Cohen function in a kappa lambda. And since JE2 of S2 kappa 2 is lambda, which is greater than kappa 1, I will assume that for the collection, uh, for the measure 1 set of mu, the value S2 mu of kappa 2 has to be greater than kappa 1. This is going to be important in the next slide. Okay. So now I label it, uh, label some fact down at the bottom line at the second coordinate by saying that, okay, I need lambda two to be greater than kappa one. So it does not, um, it does, uh, it's not interrupt what's going on about the first two coordinates. Okay. Now I consider what it is about um, F zero and F one when you com compose, um, compose them with new inverse. Mm. So if you compute on the J M2 side, this is the out of V E2. Uh, let me write. So in M2, which is the out V E2. I'm, consider, I'm considering what F0 compose mu inverse is like. And in M2, what is represented is going to be J E2 e of F0 composed with MC2 inverse. It's going to be MC2 inverse of E2. Right? Because if you move J uh, F0 it, by J E2, it's just going to be J E2 of F0. If you consider the measure one set of such mu, then it will, in, in M2, it's going to be MC2 inverse. Okay. So what's going on here? Um, 
j e to of f zero since the domain of f zero has size kappa zero so it's less than kappa two which is the critical point of j e two this is going to be just j e two pointwise image of f zero and then if you compose it with um, mc2 inverse. Uh, remember that mc2 will map je2 of gamma to gamma. So mc2 inverse is going to map je2, uh, no. gamma into j e2 of gamma. This is by mc2 inverse. And then if you compute j e2 of f0 of j e2 gamma, it's going to be just the j e2 f0 of gamma, which turns out to be just f0 of gamma because the range of F0 is a subset of kappa 0, and kappa 0 is below kappa 2. So what I conclude is that on the measure one set, um, the composition function is just F0, which is the Cohen function with respect to kappa 0 lambda. And domain 0 is going to be something like MC2 of um, domain of j e2 of f0. Mm. Okay. And furthermore, um, just make a recall is um, by saying that lambda is just j e2 s2 kappa 2. And what is the value kappa 2? Kappa 2 is just like mc2 of j e2 of kappa 2, right? So you can say that that is a measure one set of mu such that g0 is going to be in a kappa 0 lambda 2. And the domain of g0 is going to be something like a pointwise point image of mu with domain of f0. Um, things are a little bit um, technical right now, but for the rough picture is that once you compose uh, F0 with mu inverse, before I, come, I perform much step extension with mu inverse, the height, the possible height of the first few Cohen functions are lambda. I mean, they will not reach lambda, of course, but um, the, the possible height is something, roughly speaking, is something lambda. Once you compose with mu inverse, so G0, G1, G2. G2 still have, um, has height lambda. Kappa 0 and kappa 1 now have height lambda 2, which is actually below kappa 1. And this is very important um, when we prove, about, uh, we prove the Bricky property. This kind of squishing F0, F1 down to G0 and G1 down to something which is below B of kappa 1 actually plays an important role in the proof of Ricky property. Okay. And now you should expect the same thing about B0 and B1. Okay, let me erase everything. Oh, any questions so far? Am I going too fast? I think it's okay. Okay, cool. 
Okay. Now I label a few more facts under the um, the blue conditions. So just make sure that T0 and T1 have very small heights comparing to other um, cohen functions. And now I'm considering B0 and B1. So B0 and B1 is just going to be A0 composed with new inverse, which I define it as the collection of tau composed new inverse for tau in A0. And same as B1. So I'm going to just consider what um, B1, uh, B0 looks like. And of course, I'll shift it to the M2 side, okay? So again, on, M on the M2 side, what, uh, what they look like is going to be JE2 of A0 composed with MC2 inverse. And, oh. and again, with the same game, um, JE2 of A0. So recall what A0 is. A zero is just the, how do I write this? Um, okay. So for mu in A zero, first of all, the size of domain of mu is less than kappa zero. Uh, Domain of mu is subset a subset of d zero, where the size of d zero is just kappa zero, and then the range of mu is going to be a subset of kappa zero. So if you compute a little bit about the size of a zero, the size of it is going to be just kappa zero, just because mu is a small function. So in particular, the size of A zero is just kappa zero, which is less than kappa two, which means J E two of A zero is just going to be J E two point wise image of A zero, which is now going to be the collection of J E two of tau or tau in A zero. And with the same game as the previous slide, if you compose MC with compose the set with MC2 inverse, it's just going to be okay. if I compose the set with MC2 inverse, this is going to be just collection. Or tau, the tau in A0, which is A0. So, in conclusion, when you compose JE0 of uh, JE2 of A0 with M2, MC2 inverse, it's just going to be A0, which is not just the measure one set um, corresponding to E0 of B0. Okay. So if you reflect this down, um, that's going to be a measure one set of mu such that B0 is in um, H, uh, H02 of H02 of mu kappa two, um, which respect to, I think it's mu of D zero. So, I write. Okay. So recall that H zero two of mu kappa two is just some reflection of um, E zero. So it's going to be the extender. The, the whole thing about H zero two mu kappa two is just extender. And since it's extender, you can define the domain with respect to that extender. And the domain that we are considering in this sense is going to be mu of B0. 
And the H0 to mu of kappa two is going to be kappa, kappa zero lambda two x symbol. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, let's not, uh, let's ignore the um, part about R. So uh, let me conclude uh, a few bits. So from P, from P, you, okay. from, from P, you um, extend it using mu to get Q. And then the height of Q0 and Q1 is pretty mm -hmm. low. Q1 still has this like um, height lambda, but the second component of Q2 is no longer a measure one set. So the measure one set is used. And this is why it's different from PO condition. Okay. Now, okay. Now I did the one set extension, then why not extending further? So now <laughs> let's consider tau in A4. So what's going on with the tau in A4? Once I extend it using tau in A4, uh, what's going on here is, let me see, let's see I actually write this down. Okay. From alpha greater than five, um, at least five, sorry, okay, I cannot count. Uh, greater than four, five. Uh, alpha is going to be this P alpha. So the, co the, the components beyond the slide, um, they are unchanged. At uh, um, Q4, I change it to R4 by overwriting F4 by tau as usual. And the second component of R4 is just lambda 4, which is just S4 uh, tau kappa 4. And I demand it to be greater than kappa 3. And at the second and third coordinates, I compose them with um, tau inverse as possible. So if it's a Cohen or the measure one set, I compose them with tau inverse as usual. So then the height, the height of Q2 is now going to be just lambda four. The height of Q3 is certainly lambda four. The height of lambda is still lambda. The part Q0 and Q1, they remain unchanged. So they will leave the same. And I mean, their heights are really small already. They are just at around lambda two, which is below kappa two. So you can see that once you perform a one-step extension, you basically squeeze down what's going on before, before it. <coughs> and okay, we we'll probably finish before time. Uh, okay. Okay, I think it fits in, so I don't have to do rest. So roughly speaking, um, now you have like two set extension, R zero and R one. If you take a look at them, they will be, they will leave something like a forcing defined from the extenders with um, height. I think that's people call it them with. Um, so if you consider the, the related extenders, they are now going to be something like H zero to uh, 
new, not new. to which is some kappa zero lambda two x and this is h one two uh okay h one uh h two kappa two which is kappa one lambda two x and and similar to the r two and r three they are now kappa two lambda four x and and kappa three lambda four x and <laughs> So the part R1, R0 and R1 can be treated separately or independently from R2 and R3. And also R2 and R3 can be treated um, independently from R0, R1, and R4 and so on as well. So what's going on here is R0 and R1 can be regarded as the condition with respect to E0 and E1, where uh, small E0 and small E1 where E0 and E1, they have um, length lambda two, and same as the R2, R3. R2, R3 can be considered as a condition in P, E2, E3, where E2, E3 have length lambda four. So it's like, um, how do I say this? Uh, it looks like fractal in some sense. So if I want to say one word to to do, like um, give a picture. And uh, alpha for alpha greater than equal to four can be considered as the condition P E alpha, alpha from four to omega one. So the last part is still something that looks like in the original forcing except that the R4 is no longer here in the sense that the second coordinate is not a major one set. I want to erase. Now we define P to be stronger than Q if P is a direct extension of some n step extension of Q where, uh, for some n less than omega. n can be zero. So in that case, P is going to be the direct extension of Q. This, this forcing has the supremum of kappa alpha for alpha less than omega one double plus chain condition. And the reason is the, the reason is if you consider at each P, then you can, you have the, the domain with respect to F alpha for alpha less than omega one. And the size of the alpha, is just the kappa alpha. And um, if you're familiar with the like, chain condition in tricky type forcing, well, not all of them, uh, you basically just count the number of sequences of domains. And it's essentially just a soup and then take a plus. So if you have soup double plus conditions, then you can form a, a delta system lemma at each co um, Cohen part. And just make sure that the Cohen parts, they all agree to each other. Then for the measure one set part, I think they are, they are really clearly uh, compatible. And that's how you get the soup double plus chain condition. Uh, I think I forget to say something. Maybe I don't. Uh, yeah. I forget to say about the closure, but basically, if you consider at the tail, uh, the, 
set minus alpha. So this is collection of uh, let's say q this is p in so uh no, p q if you consider the tail so it's the tail i cut off the part from zero up to but not including alpha then this p set minus alpha i think it's going to be kappa um, kappa close under the direct extension relation and together with that um with the together with the tricky property um, um you're gonna get that all kinos up to and including including the soup of kappa alpha is preserved uh, so for uh, it remains to consider the case the soup of the plus and it will be preserved by the strong cricky property uh, the fourth thing has a very particular way to build a scale on the soup of kappa alpha of length lambda, um, which will imply two to the soup is lambda. The cardinal arithmetic also reflects down for uh, beta less than omega one limit. Um, so what's going on here is, uh, let me write something. Oh, okay. uh, sorry. Uh, so if I have P alpha, alpha less than omega one. Uh, now let's assume that it's in the general extension. Beta less than omega one is limit. Then you can well, you can you can find the the condition in in G such that P beta is no longer pure. So it's going to be F beta lambda beta uh, some where lambda beta is going to be greater than the soup of kappa alpha, alpha less than beta, but it's below kappa beta. Uh, keep in mind that the sequence kappa alpha is not continuous because they are all large cardinals. And the cardinal arithmetic kind of reflects down for every limit, uh, beta less than omega one. Uh, should I say something more? Uh, okay. So a few more things. If you restrict the, uh, the scale down to the length soup and then take a plus. So from the scale that you can derive to get the two to the soup is, is lambda. You can somehow with, um, restrict uh, the scale to have length soup plus as well. And that scale will be a very good scale. That's another thing. And um Gitix has some commentarial results. I think they are uh yeah with, with some with some interleaving super compact kinos. This is forcing. Uh you can get some stationary reflection, you can get some, I think, the failure of approachability property. Uh, I think he also gets a tree property, but uh and the proof is uh, it's quite hard to follow, so I'm not sure if it's, an, it's true or not. But yeah, it's, it's interesting to know. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that's all I, I kind of have for today. Uh, yeah, sorry to finish this, finish this a bit earlier, but yeah, that's. Okay.
you know, no problem at all. No, no, it's it's totally within the usual time. It's uh, okay. totally fine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank cool. you. Um, I guess I'll turn the video on. Um, are there any any further questions? I mean, during the talk, uh, uh, Nuo already asked a few times whether there were questions, and it didn't seem so. But is, are there any comments or questions? I guess I would make a comment uh, just to verify something that I think I know, which is clearly the way this forcing is defined, even if you have a uh, sequence of countable length, let's say just the soup of the first omega many, you're going to violate GCH very often below the supremum. But I believe that Gittick has a forcing where you can add sub, where you take the supremum of a countable length of, let's say, strong cardinals, and you add as many subsets as you like to that. So to, you blow up the power set of the supremum as high as you want, but you don't add bounded subsets. So you preserve GCH below. I believe that that's the case. And I'm just saying this to confirm. Is that correct? Uh, I think so. I think. If I remember correctly, that forcing is called the extender based pricky forcing with no other adjectives. And yeah, that, um, yeah, I think that forcing is going to blow up to the soup uh, as much as you want. Um, if I remember correctly, it, it will save PCH below it. But the forcing is a little bit, I mean, this one is complicated, but that forcing is also so complicated. And I think originally he did something using the classical description of extenders. So things are more, a little bit more complicated. So the notion MC um, stands for maximal coordinate. In the past, what he did is, well, you have like a sequence of generators with respect to the extenders. And then you denote MC as the maximal ordinal um, with respect to root and Kiesler order mm -hmm. to, to, to do something. Doing it this way will help you like um, get rid of that technicality by saying, okay, you just glue the domain together and then reflect everything at once. But yeah, I think that, that that's the extended best pretty first thing. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. All right, seems like we're all satisfied. Thanks a lot for the talk. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to the second part next week. Okay, yes. Okay, and all right. Gunther, are you able to hang on for a bit? Yes, me? yes, I'll stay on, yeah. But uh, the let me see, I'll stop the recording and